Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this study here uh, with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have here this morning once again to open your word. We invite your spirit to instruct us, uh, to help us to see clearly uh, the path that is before us. We pray for each person searching for truth, those that watch these videos, those that participate. We just ask, Lord, that um, you can be with each one, that your angels can watch over them, and that your Holy Spirit can direct and guide them. Be with us now in this study as we continue to look at Samson and the time that we are in. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. So yesterday we had um, been working through Judges 16, and um, we got a little further along as far as marking the verses and the way marks on the line. And uh, so just a short review, a quick review. We know that uh, Samson has four chapters, 13 to 16. Uh, the first uh, three chapters of Samson, so that's 13, 14, and 15, uh, we put on a line of its own. Though each of the chapters is a line, we believe that that represents a complete line. And then chapter 16 uh, is a line of its own. It's a rather complex line. Um, there's lots of detail in it, lots of symbols. Um, but we began this line where the other lines sort of ended, not exactly to the date, but as far as understanding that this is, uh, this line itself is a repeat and enlarge um, and, and uh, represents the, um, well, we'll go there here just to show you. So when we deal with Samson and Delilah in this line here, you can see that this story of Samson and Delilah is this April 5th, 2030 date, which we say is the fourth angel arrives. So this is a zoom into this fourth angel way mark. And since that is the case, it's going to start um, earlier. It's going to start, the first way mark is going to be the arrival of the first angel's message for this line of Samson and Delilah is December 25th, 2021. And that's Colin and Stephen's studies. Steve Collins, of course, is a study he presented. Stephen was just noting this 777 years. And then seven weeks later, we have Odilio's study, where we get the symbol of 1629. And um, these symbols here relate to the wave offering and to Pentecost, but also um, to this... Uh, the 16th day of the second month and the 16th day of the first month, tying the period of that the manna falls. And this is connected with this increase of in knowledge. So the manna doesn't fall in this period, obviously, in the time of Samson. But we have these symbols that tie us to the falling of the manna. And then what we had done is we had taken uh, those as the arrival and the formalization. So the empowerment was this study that we had done where we used the 1629 um, in confirming that Thanksgiving in 2022, November 24th, 2022, was um, uh, this specific way mark. And this way mark is relating to uh, 2,688 2, days to April 5th, 2030. Now, uh, this 2688, we spent a bit of time with that. We know it's that IRS form, uh, an application for additional extension of time to file. Um, 
And then we took the Hebrew number 2688, which means to be cut off in the midst of, or the palm is cut off in the midst. Um, so this refers to the cross. This is, um, and we had all kinds of symbolism there in the story of Samson and Delilah that tied us to the story of Christ's crucifixion, tied us to Psalm 22. Um, so there was lots of different uh, uh, details that we uh, gathered from the study of this chapter. We have the symbols midnight. Um, and midnight itself here is two different words, 2677. Um, and uh, 2677 means, and it's related to the word 2688. Uh, so 2677 means half or middle or midst or part or two parts. And Lila is the word for night. So you have the 391.5 because the Hebrew number there is 391.5. And then we also had this um, uh, other symbol dealing with... Um, where is this here? So when we got to, well, we had this, the, the gates and the posts representing the chiasm being brought to the top of a hill before Hebron. And, and then we had also, we were looking at Delilah, the symbol there, 1807, and uh, where she's from, the Valley of Sorek. 7796, and that is um, re reference to the vine. And, and we still don't know why they have two different Hebrew numbers for this word, Sorak. So if you look up 7797 in the dictionary here, you can see that it says the same as 8361. So it's got this... Uh, Shin Vav Reshkov, that's how it's spelled, Sorek, means choice vines. And if you look up 8321. Um, you see, it's the same word. That means uh, choice species of vine or cho choice grapes. It can be spelled different, sorica, with a, a he at the end, but it can be spelled these three different ways. So this is just kind of a different spelling, but it's quite a different uh, number. Now, Dwight noticed that if you subtracted uh, Sorek, which is 7796, from Sorek, which is 8321, you get this number 525. And so we had addressed that in these way marks. So we can see this here. This is December 25th, 2022, which we say is the arrival of the second message. So there's still a few things we have to sort through. Um, Uh, just dealing with these verses. So you can see you got basically 6, 1, 6, 2, 6, 3, 6, 4, or 16, 1, 16, 2, 16, 3, 16, 4, aligning up these way marks. Um, so this message, what is it? What is it that arrives on December 25th, 2022, based on 16, verse 4? that this is a message that you first have to receive the first message in order to be benefited by this message. Now we know that Samson is a type of Christ. Delilah is a woman representing a church. Her name means languishing. She's from the Valley, Valley of Sorek, these choice vines. So it relates to this movement. So what is this message though that arrives on December 25th, 2022 symbolically?
aren't we being shown that each of these presentations that preceded December 25th, 2022 have light that is needed to be gathered? Well, it's definitely light that needs to be gathered. So the second message is about this gathering of this light, right? Delilah, her, her also the number for her name is 1807. Right. So that's the 18th of July, right? Um, so this is about this message. It's about uh, the period, the light that basically occurs after July 18th to December 25th, 2021. Uh, that light that we initially get after the disappointment is in that 525 days, right? So she, she, she's in the Valley of Sorek and we get that 525 symbol from that. We also get this idea of um, um, with the vine. I mean, this is is what what's what was the the point about the choice vine? Where did where did it lead us? When we looked at the three verses that contained the. English version of this Hebrew word. We saw a progression. Choice, choicest to noble. Yeah. So, and we see this here. We got um, in the King James Concordance. We got, uh, it was Genesis 49, 11. Right. It will bring us, and we, we didn't dwell on this one too much, but it brings us to... Uh, Right? It brings us to what? Judah. Right. Right. So it brings us to Judah. And, and this is the blessing of Jacob. Uh, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass is cold unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So the main idea that we have here is that this is about Christ coming and his crucifixion. Right? And it, it also involves the symbol of islam yes yeah and um and then we have isaiah 5 verse 2 he fenced it gathered out the stones there have planted it with cho choices vine built a tower in the midst of it and made a wine press therein etc now the interesting thing too remember um uh the uh, the symbol of 52. What, what's 52 a symbol of? I don't recall. Well, you should be the one who, who remembers. Okay. Because you're the one who presented it. Remember uh, 49 plus 3? Right. Okay. So what is the symbol? I remember 49 plus 3, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Okay, so it happened in the story of Nehemiah, the okay. 50 days. So there's right. three days that they, that he, he basically, he comes to Jerusalem and he secretly looks at the situation. And then they begin to build the walls. And it's completed in 52 days. And so the, the idea is that there's three plus 49 to get the 52. So um, now how would that relate? How would that symbol relate to this movement at the present time? Showing that we need the understanding of the Sabbath, because we have the 49, seven by seven. Yeah. To bring us into unity, because the three is the representation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And the three days is a symbol, as well as the 49 being a symbol. Correct. Because 
to be 52. Whether this is really significant there, the main thing that we looked at with Judges 16 is they compassed him and laid in wait all the night, right? So we have these symbols of night, of morning, of the midst of the night, right? Midnight, um, the, the middle of the night. And so there's just tons of symbols piled upon each other here, referring to the idea that this is about uh, Christ, right? Him coming to die for us. And one of the things that we have focused on, uh, well, especially on Friday nights, is the message of righteousness by faith and what that means uh, to Seventh-day Adventists and to this movement. Um, and of course, without that conversion experience, it's meaningless to talk about um, anything else. I mean, we need to overcome sin in our lives. We need to have, have Christ's character in us. In order for us to be united, we need to be united with Christ. And if we're in rebellion to Christ, we're not going to be united with him or with each other. It'll be manifest in division. And so the fact that the movement is so divided is evidence of its lack of connection to Christ. So that's part of this message. Um, so we're saying that Judges 16, verse 4, is the arrival of this second message. And when we put it on a line, my suggestion is that this is relating to um, this upcoming Sabbath, that this is going to be a formalization of this message. So one is there's an invitation to the movement for them to come together on December 25th, 2022, right? That is in the study of the line simply presented. And this is the next major invitation. Of course, we have put, you know, the posters, we mentioned that we're gonna have a camp meeting, but we're going to begin more actively promoting what the camp meeting is about and why we need to, to come to that camp meeting. And Dwight, you're going to be talking uh, to them on Sabbath during their studies at some point, correct? I'll give them, yes, I will, I will make contact. Okay, good. And then I'm su suggesting that um, the empowerment of this message is going to be the camp meeting. So I just put July 24th uh, when the camp meeting begins. And then I put October 8th, 2030 as um, the date in which it's formalized. Now, this was based upon Dwight's idea that this first part represents the 525 um, that we have here. So we have the 777 as the first angel arriving, the 525 being... Uh, December 25th, 2022. And then um, we have the 252 represented when the third angel arrives. And my suggestion was that the 252 is counting from the end of the 2520 for Judah on October 22nd, 1844, on the 10th day of the seventh month, and counting 2300 months brings us to October 8th, 2030, right? So it's going to be 186 cardinal days past April 5th, 2030. So in this line, we don't have April 5th, 2030. We just have this October 8th, 2030. So we're saying that this, this line of Samson and Delilah, Delilah points us to the Day of Atonement, um, in 2030, rather than to the first day of the first month in 2030. And I showed how, if we count these 354 prophetic months from September 11th, 2001, it's going to bring us to October 8th, 2030, as the, the end of that 300, 354 months. Prophetic months, and that comes from Ezra um, seven to ten, which 
which is, of course, regarding the seventh month, the 10th day. Those three chapters all deal with the start of the 2300 days, <clears throat> as well as the 70 weeks. So putting these dates out on the line and giving them uh, specific way marks, um, I don't have anything for the fourth angel arriving other than if I was going to um, put something here, I would just put simply that it's the Sunday law. That is, I don't have a date for it. But I would put that symbol as this fourth angel arriving. Now we know that um, the fourth angel arriving in the line of the judges we have is April 5th, 2030. So April 5th, 2030, whether it's an actual date or just symbolic, um, it points us to a repeat of history. So what this would suggest is that the history that this movement is presently going through is uh, going to be repeated on a larger scale sometime in the future. Doesn't have to be anything connected with these actual dates. It's just that it shows that our history is typical. Now it's also needed, that is this reform line that we are in is needed. It's needed because it gives us specific light as Seventh-day Adventists. And it also gives us an experience that can make us useful in this final work that needs to be done. Uh, at the present point of time, it doesn't appear that we are very useful. We're definitely not effective in reaching Seventh-day Adventists. So when we zoom into that fourth angel arriving way mark, we see that it, really, it leads us to what this line is all about. This is all about the coming Sunday law. All of the history of this movement is addressing the Sunday law. That is, we are in the time of the Sunday law, at least since 9-11 and, and probably since November 9th, uh, 1989. But 9-11 specifically, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. That's the Sunday law. So in our line, we have the Sunday law arriving at 9-11. That's how Jeff had understood it. That's the second angel arriving. But our line is just to zoom into the actual Sunday law. So our line has to lead us there, but it, it's not going to show us the date of the Sunday law. Correct? We're not, we're not going to be able to predict when the Sunday law is going to be. We can sort of say when it's not going to be. That is, we know that things have to occur before there is a Sunday law. And an Adventist in the past, in the Millerite movement, um, when they were looking for the second coming of Christ, which symbolizes the Sunday law, um, October 22, 1844, they, they ignored all of the things that they knew had to occur prior to the second coming of Christ. They just ignored those things. And Adventists uh, tend to do that as well. And even in this movement, we can talk about like a Sunday law is going to be coming. But a Sunday law is not going to be coming unless a work has been done prior to the Sunday law. So what is being illustrated in this lines primarily is that there is a work that needs to be done. So let's look at these verses and try to see how these verses can relate to um, April 8th, 2023, July 24th, 2023, and October 8th, 2030. <clears throat> so we have this, this part here that that's going to be... Um, Where, where the Philistines, the lords of the Philistines, now how many lords of the Philistines are there? Is there not five? 
Yeah, there's five, right? And how do we know that? Aren't they the leaders of the five main cities of the Philistines? Yeah, so so we're told this other places, right? Um, that would have been... Uh, Yeah, Judges 3, 3, namely five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, etc. So it's going to talk about these five lords of the Philistines. So there's five. And there's going to be 1,100 pieces of silver uh, being offered to Delilah, right? They want um, her to entice Samson. They want to know where his wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him. So they want to know what makes him strong and what they need to do to conquer him. And um, because they want to bind him and afflict him. Um, the idea of afflict here, uh, basically uh, like it sounds, they want to abase him, chastise him, uh, all kinds of different things that could, that it could mean. Um, so this is definitely torture, right? They want to punish him. Um, yes. And and so they they are all going to give her eleven hundred pieces of silver. Now we debated about this previously whether this is eleven hundred times five or whether this is um, two twenty times five. Both would be 1100. Um, uh, so the idea here is that um, each of us are going to give you money that's going to total 1100 pieces of silver. At least that was my suggestion. Whether everybody agreed with me or not, I don't know. Now, I can't remember all the things that we did with this 1100. I know we looked at it as periods of time. And we, we dealt a little bit trying to figure out how, how much it was. But weights and measures are a difficult topic. So we just have, to me, the strongest symbol there is 5 and 220. So 5 times 220 equaling 1100. 220 being the number of restoration, of course, and the five can refer to the five foolish or the five wise. But in this case, it's it's representing the five, whether wise or foolish. <clears throat> so then we're going to have three times that um, Delilah is going to ask Samson where his great strength comes from and three times he's going to give her false uh, stories about where his strength comes from, right? Now, we we know there's a fourth as well and the fourth is going to be the truth which is going to deal with his Nazarite vow. And so we can see a 3-1 combination. And so we can see those represent what? What are they going to represent on our line? So it's going to represent this repeat of history. Now, what I suggest, and, and other people, if you have ideas about it, but I suggest that this Sunday law, which is the fourth, that is what is being represented in this story, right? So you're going to have the first three. That's going to be the first, second, and third angel's message. Now, we know that, that those this history is repeated. Now, we could argue, well, this is just a repeat and enlarge, and it's just going to represent... Uh, December 25th, 2021, and December 25th, 2022, and October 8th, 2030, or something like that, right? We could we could argue that, and then that the fourth is, is going to represent the Sunday law. 
But I'm saying that, in my view, that these represent events that are still future. That is the Sunday law itself. And, and we can see this in the symbols that are going to be shown. Any thoughts on that? Dwight, you have some thoughts? I'm just, <clears throat> I'm considering what you were saying. So this, if, if this is to show events that are future or leading us to an event that is future is future then we have we we've given a, a correct construction of the line mm -hmm. i mean i'm the whole thing that that we're seeing right now as a movement we are not in unity as you pointed out mm -hmm. In order for us to go forward to give a message, unity is going to be required, just as it was required of the disciples and those that met with them in the upper room prior to the 50th day, where we are now calling Pentecost, which was the Feast of Weeks. Yeah. Now... The message that is to be given is one of pending judgment, right? Yeah. Because we have the examples from Ezra, but also the examples from Ezekiel. And Peter is witness to that as well, because where does this message of judgment need to be given first at the house of god before before um, the ancients at the house of god yeah so with this with this in mind we're going to be making an offer for others to join with us Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, if the others choose to reject the offer and choose to reject going forward, then the camp meeting itself will become much, <clears throat> much like the upper room mm -hmm. for those that are willing to listen to come together, to confess sins, and, and to be united with the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole reason I believe that we're called to do the camp meeting, to pro provide that opportunity. Right. One is it's fairly difficult, you know, through Zoom to deal with these types of conflicts. I mean, obviously, there's an individual work that needs to be done. But there comes a point where you do have to come together physically, you know, to see each other as people, because Zoom is, is still rather impersonal, especially when in the meetings you can't see anyone's face. You can't see any expressions that they have, right? I mean, I really, I okay. mean, I know not everybody's going to show me their face all the time on Zoom, but... But to me, if you're communicating with people, and especially when there is uncertainty about how people are receiving what you're saying, um, you know, not being able to see them, a group of people talking to a group of people um, is quite difficult, right? It's it much, easier, much easier to see people in person. You can see their reactions. You know, you can watch for... You know, if their eyes are rolling into the back of their heads, you can actually see it. And, and then you know that you've said something or you have some kind of problem with the person. Otherwise, you can just imagine that you do, right? Um, you know, so it's to read a person in front of you instead of uh, just listening to his voice. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, and also if they're not even saying anything. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there's people there and nobody's saying anything. You don't know what their reaction is. You don't know if they're smiling or frowning or uh, they look interested or they look disinterested. You know, you don't know any of that. So obviously being in person is, is very, very helpful in communication. Now, um, when we look at these verses that, uh, that follow, so we have this 16 verse four, we're saying is this arrival of the second message. And 16 verse five is going to be the lords of the Philistines, these five lords of the Philistines, um, going to Delilah and saying, entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth. And by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give the every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So if we're putting this at April 8th, 2023, if we're going to take that verse, we're just going to follow through what we've been doing. And we say, well, the next verse, 16 verse 5, is going to be... Um, this uh, formalization is going to represent that. That's what I'm suggesting. Um, we, we have some symbols here that, that we would need to uh, understand. So we have the five lords of the Philistines, the foolish and the wise. And how would that relate to the formalization of the message? Think of Millerite history. Are you referencing those that were part of the message during the Millerites and then chose to to close the doors, such as the as the Protestant churches did? Okay, so we know that there is the tearing of the of the virgins, right, or the tearing of the bridegroom and the virgins, five are wise, five are foolish. Some have oil in their lamp, um, or or in their um, yeah, but some some didn't bring extra oil, right, and so a cry goes out at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. That's midnight is the formalization of the message in Millerite history, right? It's July 21st. And then it's going to be empowered at Exeter. Right. So, so I'm saying that 16 verse 5 is this formalization of the message. And it's going to have this the five symbolized there. It also has 220, which is a symbol of restoration, right? And also this 1100, whatever that means. Agreed. But we do know that um, in the 22 years, in the 22 generations, um, they're divided as 11 and 11, right? So the five can be dividing, you know, the five wide, the five foolish, and the 11 representing the 22, right? And the fact that it's 220 would relate to that. Right. I mean, as, as we're looking at this, you have the five lords of the Philistines. And as the verse read that you had, you had just reminded us with, mm -hmm. Each one was offering 1,100 pieces of silver. Well, each was offering 220. Okay. Altogether, they're offering 1,100 is the way that I understand it. And we yeah, had looked at the, we had the, looked at the Hebrew. Earlier. Yeah, and, and we had looked at the Hebrew to show that originally when we had when we looked at it. Um, so it wasn't. Uh, yeah, that whole episode kind of caused a stir on that. Uh, it, was, it was talked about for a while, the 1100 yeah. and the 220. Yeah, and 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 it's it's kind of difficult in the Hebrew because there's going to be different ideas about how to trans translate this. But and and I could be wrong. Uh, lots of the translations will say we're each going to give you 1100 pieces of silver. Right. You're going to see translations like that. 
Um, but it to me, it's it's clear from the Hebrew that that's not the case. That each of us are going to give you eleven hundred pieces of silver in Hebrew wouldn't mean the same thing in English. That is, the expression in Hebrew would mean each one of us is going to give you this amount, which is in total 1,100, right? But if you translate it literally and put it into English, it will sound like each one is giving 1,100 individually. So, I mean, we could examine that again, um, but... But that's the way that we had done it before. That we had decided that it was five times two twenty. So, um, so if that's it, and, and sixteen, um, sixteen five. Um, there's something else about that. I can't remember what it is, but um, now the next verse is going to be 16.6. Now, what's the significance of 16.6? So the verse itself, itself says, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. So this to me is this first, um, this is the sort of the beginning of this, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, plea by Delilah to Samson, right? She wants him to give away his secret. Now, so this secret, now, one of the things about that verse is 16.6 represents FFA because uh, F is 6 and A is 1. And so it goes AFF, which would just be FFA backwards. <clears throat> so can we put this as the empowerment of the second angel's message. That is, this, this is pointing to the third angel arriving. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, as we have, as we've discussed, the situation with Samson here, we are looking at in the ironic, correct? Morally ironic, yes. Mm -hmm. So that means we ignore the the moral overtones, right? We don't look at it from a moralistic point of view um, because it's not showing us the morals from a positive point of view; it's from a negative point of view. All right. But now, we keep the symbology without being ironic. Yeah, we keep the symbols. The symbols still without, are without symbols. without them being ironic. Right. The symbols are not ironic. Symbols are taken as the symbols that they are. Okay. We have Samson telling her first. If they bind me with seven green cords that were never dried, and they try this, and it fails, of course. And Delilah says, you mocked me. Mm -hmm. And the next time, he said, if you bind me fast with new ropes that have never been occupied, they try this, and it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't say seven new ropes, just seven ropes, or just ropes. 
Just let's give the numbers. So you got the seven widths, widths or bow strings. Widths, yes. But it doesn't give any number regarding the ropes. And the third time. Weaving his hair into the the loom, the the loom. Right. Now could these three false examples represent the messages of the corporate church? and other portions of this movement and the truth of the strength represent this study. Hmm. To explain more how you come to that conclusion. Well, I'm looking at this because the majority of what we're dealing with with Samson is Samson being the promotion of a message, a very a, a very specific message. Now, currently, we are all aware that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was raised up to give the third angel's message to the world. But it is languished in this situation. It is not given the message that it was supposed to give. Mm -hmm. We've had those that right now would prefer to focus on Trump rather than the studies. Yeah. We've had others that are willing to focus on basic Adventism, but not really collecting any new light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of this is not advancing the position or the understanding of where we are at this time. Now, mm -hmm. when it comes to Samson finally revealing the source of his strength, he's basically saying that this is where the understanding needs to be at this time. Okay. Now, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Well, yeah. Um, now, as far as, you know, fitting the corporate church into to all this, um, I mean, to me, this is all internal, but we do come to the Sunday law itself. Now, now I'm putting um, here with October 8th, 2030, it's the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So it does represent the Sunday law, but it's not marking the actual event of the Sunday law. That is, this would be something much more internal within the movement, right? And I'm not saying that happens on October 8th, 2030. I'm just saying that's what it symbolizes. Now, when we take these three, I mean, we could say, you know, that all of these three happen there. But what I'm seeing in, is that Delilah says to Samson, tell me your secret, right? Now, this is going then to be Samson. presenting three different uh, three different way marks, the first, second, and third angel. But those are not going to occur in connection with October 8th, 2030. Those are going to connect in connection with the Sunday law. 
That is, if we zoomed into this way mark here, that is the fourth angel arriving, we would have, um, obviously, if, you know, once that way mark happens, once the Sunday law occurs, I think that we will see much more clearly the events and the timing of the first, second, and third angel's message in connection with the Sunday law. Now, so when you think about it, remember, this whole movement is a zoom into the Sunday law, right? Correct. Okay. So if we have a way mark that we now mark as the Sunday law, that's the fourth angel arriving. And it is the actual Sunday law that we're talking about then actually all of our history can be represented by these three um, tests, we'll call them, that uh, Delilah places upon Samson. And that would represent our history. Right? So, it, so we're zooming into a waymark. And so far we've had all these, every time you zoom into a waymark, you see... Um, the whole line, right? You get a line again. But now we're going to zoom into this final way mark here in Samson, which, which is the Sunday law. Now, really, the Sunday law is the death of Samson. I mean, if we wanted to put it that way, we can just say all of these things lead up to the death of Samson. And the death of Samson represents the Sunday law. Okay. We're focused on this being the, the death of Samson, but what if this is the lifting up of Samson? Well, yeah. Yeah, it, it is the lifting of, up of Samson because it's Christ being lifted up. But just remember, that part would be, we don't look at it as the death in the negative sense because Samson represents Christ and Christ at the end of the world is lifted up in his people right right so but what i'm saying here is we're zooming into this final one but it actually illustrates our entire line right and of course that's what a fractal does that's what happens when you zoom in you do see the entire line but if we were going to take this fourth angel arriving and we were going to create a line with it that would be the line of the judges. That would be the line of our history. That would be from 1989 to, you know, the close of probation. Right? Because it is the actual Sunday law. But the actual Sunday law, we're already, we're really in that Sunday law. So, so we, this, what this brings to us is the idea that when we're zooming in and we're creating a line, you know, we can mark specific events and details and dates. Um, but that line is always illustrating something that's still future. But when you actually look at the something that's still future, it, it has all kinds of magnifications, right? And, and we definitely can't know what those dates are in the future but we can look at our line and see how our our line relates to the sunday law because we do have dates and so so when we get to the end of the story of samson and delilah we're just given the whole story over again in this illustration now <clears throat> so we we could argue that um october for 8th, 2030 is representing the first three and uh, the death of Samson, which is going to be with the fourth test, is going to be the Sunday law. We could argue that. Um, so we could just say that this is 16.6 to um, uh, when he gets captured or something like that. Um, So I'm not sure how, how to do that, but um, I'm not sure if we even need to work out the details of it. Just the general idea that 
what Samson is leading us to is the Sunday law. Because we don't know what those dates are. We don't have any, um, you know, we have this future date, the 10th day of the seventh month, which represents the Sunday law. But that's it. I mean, when we address, address the death of Samson, we understand that this is the Sunday law. We've understood that for a long time, right? Agreed. Now, some things here about um, uh, these... Uh, uh, these other verses, so 16 verse 7, right? So whether 16 verse 7 should be marked as the fourth angel arrive and this is future, we can still see that it relates to the whole line. Now, one of the reasons we have that it's the Sunday law, um, so if you buy me with seven green widths or bowstrings that were never dried, then I shall be weak and be as other men. So we're going to take 16 verse 7, and 16 verse 8 where it says then the lords of the philistines brought up to her seven green widths which had not been dried and she bound him with them so so the seven represents the sabbath so the issue of the sabbath and the sunday And, and we can see how the Sabbath is tied to the first angel's message, right? Fear God and give glory to the hymn for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters, right? It's going to refer back to the 10, to 10 commandments, to the Sabbath commandment. Right? Now we also have 16.8. So 16.8 as a verse represents the week, right? Because there's 180, 168 hours in a week. So we have the week represented. So this is the first test. This test is about the Sabbath. And then we're going to have the second test. So the second test, test is new ropes that never were occupied. So what would these new ropes have to do with, um, let's say, the second angel's message? I mean, this is the first place in the Bible where, uh, uh, no, it's not. There's Exodus 28. Uh, it's just going to be chains. It wouldn't have to do with faith, would it? With these ropes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Faith. yeah, sometimes we look at ropes as being faith. Was there three? Did they use three on him there? No. He's just bound with new ropes that have never been occupied. Never been used. Well, I think it could stand for each one of us having that link with, with God and we are responsible to cooperate with him to be saved. And then I'm thinking of those dreams about the rope that helps us across the chasm as we're going mm -hmm. along that trail toward toward heaven. And the dream about the green cord, I think when it was pressed close to the heart or something, it 
helped helps us stay close to God. Yeah. So we can't look at these things in a negative sense, right? I mean, we, we know that this Samson represents Christ. Delilah represents the church. But this isn't like the church necessarily being bad. This is a test that is that they're going through, the church is going through. So, you know, we, we have the Sabbath, and then we have these new ropes, which represent, I would say, faith. Right? And then we have this one with the weaving, right? The web. That's going to be this um, spreading out. The warp in a loom, right? It's stretched out to receive the woof. <clears throat> Now, th here you're going to have the seven locks of hair, right? So you're going to have seven mentioned again. And, and in this case, Samson, he's awakened out of his sleep, and he's usually sleeping, right? So, um, And he went away with the pin, the beam, and within the web, and with the web. And she said it to him, how canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. So the great strength lieth in the Nazarite vow. Right? Yes. Yeah, and this is this is about Christ. So this is this is not Christ being defeated, this is Christ being victorious. In his people. Um, so these are messages. These, this is light that's going to come to this movement. And it has come to this movement. It's just going to grow and expand. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily. Now that word daily means um, the whole day with her words, and urged him so his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. And if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart she sent and called for the lords of the philistines saying come up this once for he has showed me all his heart then the lords of the philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand and she made him sleep upon her knees and she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head <coughs> and she began to afflict him and his strength went from him and she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that he that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. So, so we have all four of these events. Samson is bound. Now, do we put these at the fourth angel arriving, or do we just put them at the third angel arriving? How do we divide these up? Do we take the death of Samson as, as just an expansion of the Sunday law line itself? How do we do that? What would we do? What would be the process we go through? As we've been going through, to consider if these morally untrue statements of Samson should all be taken as one portion of our line. 
with you what know. you're what you're referring to here as being for the arrival of the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. Which is the Sunday law. Right. In like if we looked at this as the line of the Millerites, October 8th, 2030 represents October 22, 1844, which we mark as the Sunday law because it's the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay. And, and we can say that all of these messages come there. But the fourth is our history, right? Like if you looked at Millerite history, it would be the repeat of history. And so if you look at our history as a repeat of history, we're also typifying something that's going to still come in the future, which is the actual Sunday law. And so the actual Sunday law definitely has to be the death of Samson in this line. Like I wouldn't take the death of Samson itself, that section from 1623 uh, to 1631 and say, well, that's, that's a whole other line. At least I wouldn't. I mean, obviously, even if it is a way mark, it is a, a line. But I'm just saying it, it isn't just a whole other line. It's actually this fourth way mark. Right? That is, if we're putting it on these lines, we're not just saying it's, it's repeating all of these previous history. It's actually a future re repeat of history. Okay. It's a repeat of our line. So in that sense, it's a single way mark that has to occur as the fourth or the eighth way mark, right? The fourth angel arriving becomes the eighth way mark. See, and, and this, this goes back to, you know, what Jeff initially said in the prophetic, prophetic uh, chain. Now, now, at first, he, when he was doing the prophetic chain in 2010, he wasn't laying out these way marks like this. But he was using this 3-1 combination. And that when you get to uh, the end, you're going to have this, again, another 3-1 combination. And, and you just keep having them all chained together, right? That was the whole idea of the prophetic chain. And what we have seen is that we can use that principle that he was talking about, but we can use them in the lines themselves. So we know that we have seven way marks, but then you have um, the fourth, right? Which is the eighth, right? Now that fourth has in it, a first, second, and a third, because our history, which is the fourth angel arriving, also is a reform line. So this is something that we have known for a long time in this movement about how we formulate lines. But we just haven't been consistent in seeing how it's done. And, and we hadn't fully understood that each way mark in a line is a line itself, not just the last one. Um, does anybody know why uh, European music uses an H for the note B? Anybody know, even know what I'm talking about? I have no, nothing to offer as to why they use it that way. Okay. You know, that they, people do people know that they use an H for the, the note B? First time I've heard. Okay. So maybe I shouldn't use this example. But, but it's just, um, but I'll, I'll just try to do it briefly. So we know that the musical alphabet goes A, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, right? That's how we would do this, right? We'd, we'd go like that. So you can have this system, right? So it's just an octave. You could start at A. But you can also start at C, right? And C is normally where we start when we think of a musical scale. We don't start at A. We start at C, right? 
Now, C. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do. Right? C, S, I. Right? So there's, there's these systems of how uh, music is written. But originally, there they had this. Uh, uh, it's kind of hard to explain without explaining too much music theory that you're not going to understand. But basically, it's a major scale. Do re mi fa so la ti do do ti la so fa mi re do. Right. But that's a movable do. When I say do re mi fa so la ti do, that's a movable do. I can start on any note. But let's just let's just say we're starting on C and we're going to name these notes. Um, so you got C, D, E, F, G, A, and B, right? So B is your seventh note, correct? C would be your octave. Right. right. Okay. Now, um, that seventh note, now they never used to have sharps and flats. The only thing had was... Um, the B flat, and the reason why they use the B flat is because it avoided, um, if you're singing a melody, it would avoid the tritone, that is the diminished fifth, which is, is uh, considered an evil interval. So, they, so instead of going from F to B, which sounds demonic, uh, they would flatten the B, and they called it the soft B, where the regular B would be the hard B. And that's why they use an H. So the H representing the hard B. And the soft B was written as a, uh, a small sort of B, and that represents the flat symbol. And so later is when they started making other notes flat, they just used that B flat symbol, that, that B flat, and they used it as an example of flats. And the H ended up becoming the sharp symbol. It's a long story. But, um, but the point that I'm making here is that there is something in nature, which is a musical scale, that has a seventh, but it also has an eighth. Does that make sense? I believe it does. OK. Now we think often of the octave itself, but even within that, that seventh way mark, there are two different, the seventh note of the scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, there is a hard B and a soft B. And we already understand that the musical scale represents palmoni, right? Because there's eight notes in a diatonic scale from octave to octave. And there's 13 notes in a chromatic scale from octave to octave, right? So the two scales, the eight note scale and the 13th scale is Daniel 813. But it's also interesting that the, the scales as you've just addressed them, mm -hmm. the eight note scale for the octave and then the chromatic scale with the 13 notes. Yeah. Added right. together, come up to 21, which was the time of the formalization of the message with the Millerites. Yeah. And, and you also have, of course, 13 as rebellion and 8 as resurrection. Correct. The contrasting ideas. No, so the, the, and these are things that, you know, come from nature, right? So, um, so God has used these things to illustrate these way marks. But the point that I'm making is that when we look at the seventh, so if you have that scale where you have the B flat and the B, you actually have eight notes within that scale. But the eighth is just the third or the seventh, right? It's the third angel arriving. It's the seventh. It's just the soft and the hard, right? The flat and the, just the natural one that would, would occur. So, um, what what is occurring here in this in this idea that we have of these lines? So, one of the things we've looked at with these lines, 
um, when we looked at the presidents of the United States, when we looked at Nero, uh, the line of Nero, um, when we look at Revelation 17, we know that we have the seventh and we have the eighth, right? Because the eight is of the seven. It's one of the seven, correct? Good application, yes. So, so there's something that we haven't fully dug into when it comes to uh, these lines. That is, we know that we are are typifying something that's going to happen. We, at least we should know that. We should know that we are not, the, the events that we are marking, the things that we have marked prophetically are not the actual events themselves that, that they're typifying, right? They're just a type, right? Just like the story of Esther. It has a type of the Sunday law. It's not the Sunday law. But we know at some point we will have the Sunday law itself, that it occurs. All of these lines of history from the beginning of the world, all of these lines in prophecy, have all typified the events at the end of the world. But the event itself does eventually come. And watching and waiting, part of watching and waiting, is recognizing the typical events before the actual events. Now, why is that necessary to understand the typical events? How is that connected with watching and waiting? Why do we have to do this in order to be watching and waiting? Because most people think watching and waiting is doing nothing, right? Unfortunately, that's the way most would, would uh, try to use that. Yes. So you, you'll see something, Adventist, oh, we're not supposed to know the day. We're just supposed to be watching and waiting. Well, what are you watching and waiting for? What does that actually mean? Well, one day, you know, we'll just, we're, we're just waiting, which is like doing nothing. And, you know, we're looking out the window. I don't see the Sunday light well yet, sort of thing, right? Right. Yeah, that's okay. the impression I get. Yeah, it's like, you know, we just occupy till he comes, right, sort of thing. So let's just, you know, live our lives. And, and you know, one day we'll, we'll see the Sunday law and, and we'll know what to do then. But that's not watching. No, that, sorry, Theodore. That reminds me of, of, of the parable about the marketplace. The people were standing around idle and, and the boss came and said, oh, why are you just shiftless? Come on, I'll hire you. And even though they only worked, worked for an hour, they received full pay. Yeah. Watching and waiting is an active thing, not a passive thing. It means digging into the scriptures studying, understanding prophecy, going through experiences, going through trials, measuring the time, looking at all of these dates, because we know after we measure the time, we will find that it was the time. We'll know what the time was, and we've seen that. We've been measuring the time, but as events have unfolded in this movement, we could see them, and often when we were just passing over them, did we first really come to understand them? So we know that the Sunday law is coming, but as far as this line of Samson and Delilah at the present time, this application we have in front of us is telling us that if we are to give a message, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, come out of her my people, that you receive not of her plagues, right? In order for us to give that message, that's the message of FFA, right? That's what FFA was raised up for. And what I believe is that, you know, the coming camp meeting 
at least is meant to bring together the message of FFA with the people who have been following that message, to be united, to proclaim the coming Sunday law. So if we're going to just finish off this chart here, we're going to say, well, it's going to be 16, uh, verse 6, to 1622. And what do we get when we do that? Um, and that's going to be the third angel arriving. So, um, I mean, we could say it's 16, verse Seven, but I'm going to include verse 16 twice or verse six twice, chapter 16, verse six twice. Right. So I'm just going to say that this is, is six to 22, even though I have the other one is 16, verse six. That's because these two are tied together. Right. In the story itself. <clears throat> That makes sense. So Delilah is going to say to Samson, that's going to be the empowerment of the second angel, but it's going to be also the same message that is, is about the third angel, right? The third angel is going to be about Samson's uh, experience. Um, so we're going to take all of those, the first, second, and third, and fourth, we're going to combine them all together as the third angel arriving. But that third angel arriving includes the fourth angel arriving because the fourth angel is the second angel, right? Agreed. So then we're going to have 16, 23 to 31. That's going to be this this fourth angel arriving is describing this Sunday law. So that's going to be 23 to 31. Okay. And that finishes off Samson and Delilah as a study. So we can see where it's pointing to. It's pointing to this Sunday law. But this Sunday law that is going to be a repeat of this movement. And again, October 8th, 2030, we're not saying that that's the Sunday law. We're saying that that date ties in symbolically to the story of Ezra 7 to 10, which is what this movement is proclaiming. And so the Sunday law could come before them. It could come after them. Yeah, so 16.6 uh, is FFA reversed, and 6.22 represents FFA. Yes, because that's the date that is the symbol, June 22nd. It's the symbol of FFA. <clears throat> okay any more thoughts on what we're seeing here right now I'm just trying to look at this mm -hmm. to make a further application out of this portion on how we would line this out against revelation 14 and revelation 18 i mean i the, the study that i've been doing there has applied this as looking at it with appetite presumption and love of the world and I can see the first portion with the appetite 
I can see the love of the world with the last portion. I'm just trying to puzzle out how I would see the presumption. Okay. <clears throat> and how I'd be able to present that. Well, maybe we're presumptuous to think that July 24th is going to be the upper room experience. No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I know it's supposed to be. No, I agree. I believe it will be. Yeah. I do believe it will be too. But, you know, I've had lots of doubts, you know, about the whole thing. Just because I, you know, we, we all initiated, but it was my idea. Um, but I've had this conviction for a long time that we need to have a camp meeting. And, you know, the question was, how are we going to go about doing that? Well, when we're divided in the way that we are, I didn't see that it's possible to, you know, to try to sit down with everybody and say, okay, you know, let's, let's have a cap meeting and where is it going to be and what are you going to do? And um, Cause there'd just be too much politics. Okay. With all the major studies that elder Jeff did, he always had a name for the, for those studies and for those camp meetings, right? Yeah. Have we come up with a name yet? Well, it should be the upper room. Well, okay. I'm I'm looking at this in a maybe a little odd way, and I'll, I'll I'll give this for everybody's consideration. What if this was the C4 camp meeting? I don't know what that means. Neither do I. What does that mean? Okay. What have been, what has been the basis for the Sabbath studies and for our daily studies the last several months? Understanding the lines. Well, the Sabbath studies have been primarily on character and covenant. Right? And these studies on a daily basis have been on chronology so if if our studies are all related then character and covenant and chronology would be pointing us directly to christ there are four there's c4s there's there's my, okay now there would be some that would look at this and they would think why is this being presented as C4? Because C4 is an ordinance. Right? <laughs> That's yeah. what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. That's it's pretty explosive. That stuff up. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's too Always much. Open it, those old bottles. Yeah, I, I think it's too much of a pun. But um, here's, here's another idea. I mean, we're having the camp meeting at Telford Muse. Now, a Telford... Um, uh, Thomas Telford de designed a um, a way to uh, build roads. So this is a um, his roadways were 18 feet wide, built in three courses, a lower layer, seven inches thick, consisting of good quality foundation stone carefully placed by hand. This is known as the Telford base. A middle layer, also seven inches thick, consisting of broken stone in two inch maximum size, and a top layer of gravel or broken stone up to one inch thick. Um, so one thing we see here is the 18 and the seven. Right? Okay. But, um, you know, it's the Telford Muse camp meeting. I mean, we could use that. A muse is uh, normally a, a, a stable that's converted into housing. So muse where, where they had, uh, they used to have all these stables, right, with a, a room above it, who was ever uh, running that stable where people would put their horses. And then later they turned these into complete houses, you know, once horses had disappeared. I lived in one of those. Yeah. 
<clears throat> it was it's, it was actually a uh, a destination uh, in Portland, Maine. Um, people would uh, come into this facility. It was a, um, a rental house, basically, you know, a boarding house uh, mm -hmm. for people or a motel, could say, um, for people going yeah. in Portland. It's Portland, mm -hmm. Maine, that is. Yeah. But I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I think the upper room is a good name, but... <clears throat> But there would be some honestly. I kind of like that C4. <laughs> okay. Thank you. But the, the situation I'm looking at, Theodore. I like is, both. Yeah. Okay. Dwight. Okay. The, the situation that we would have is that there would be some that would view this as very presumptive on our parts to say that we're inviting them to the upper room because they believe that they're already part of the upper room. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a possibility right there. I mean, yeah. that's more than actually a possibility. That's kind of where I'm leaning, actually. How so, the general feeling is. Yeah, I just think that you know, maybe then the Telford Muse just, you know, camp meeting. A su that's a subtle approach. So it just you know, an 18 foot with two seven inches. So that's 18 feet times seven inches times two. You know, Telford base layer. So well, that's that. That's something that could be, you know, a great consideration because it embodies all that we have been addressing since July 18th. Yeah. Now I like so, the fact that it's a, you know, it's based upon a road. Right. Mm -hmm. the and the foundation, of the, the foundation of a road. And the yeah. So we we do need we need to have something a little bit more that we can we can be presenting with this. So that's well, I mean, I mean, definitely, this is a study on the judges. Correct. So, um, I mean, and it's it's from nine eleven to twenty twenty three um, that the period of the judges really addresses. Which is why I think, you know, 2023 is the year that we have to come together if we're ever going to accomplish anything. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, well, I'll see some of you tomorrow evening, but before we uh, close, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. Uh, we lift up the people in this movement in prayer each precious soul who has been studying for truth to understand it. And um, we pray for ourselves, Lord, that we can see our need of you. Um, we need your healing hand. We know that many in this movement and many of us face all kinds of difficulties, whether health, whether circumstances around us, financial or otherwise conflicts and, and um, disappointments and discouragements and so we need your help uh, we ask your angels to watch over each person and that you can bring us together again to study your word we pray for the camp meeting pray for dwight that you can um, go before him that your angels can watch over him and that your holy spirit can speak through him and work upon the hearts of all and help us lord to represent you in all that we do be with us now for the rest of this day we pray and ask in jesus name amen